Good morning. Well, I don't think I have to tell you guys that we have a pretty special church, don't you think? I mean, seriously. I go to a lot of places, been to a lot of churches, and uh, there's something special about fellowship. I'm, the programs we have, the children's ministries, the uh, 4640 for the youth, the adult program, and the classes that take you to a 401, 501, 601 level in your Christianity, and then the team teaching here at our church. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I can tell you right now that having team teachers at Fellowship Church makes each one of us teach better. I promise you. And here's why. Because each one of us will spend 8 to 15 hours on a 30-minute message on Sunday morning. And you say 30, ha, 30-minute message on Sunday morning. Uh, we absolutely work and pray to give you the very best we can give you. We try to hit it out every time. And three weeks ago, um, Pastor Dan brought a message uh, on the house of God and what it should be like for us being in the house of God, what our obligation was and what this place should look like. Then a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Tim brought a message on relationships and boundaries within those relationships. So many people commenting on that. Last week, the epidemic of worry, Pastor JL tackled that one. And man, that was a good one too. And today, I'm going to hit you with uh, random verses for a specific life, part two. Now, if you want to know where this comes from, this comes from my coffee time in the morning with God, right? So, ah, he will give me a verse or two, and I'll look at it, and oh, that's random, but that's so cool. I'll email it to myself. They start stacking up. This last few weeks, 65 random verses stacked up on my emails. And then I went through them, and I thought, oh, we got to talk about that. Oh, they don't know about this. Oh, we got to talk. So, anyway, that's where this is coming from. Specific life. A couple of weeks back, we talked about a specific life of being everlasting eternal, to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way you're going to have that. But today I want to talk about the specific life of being fully supported by God until you get to the eternal life. So think about that for a moment. A life that is fully supported in your marriage by the God of this universe. Your checkbook fully supported by the God of this universe. Your work, your job, your future, your health, your life. Fully supported by God. Let's take a look at the verse, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those. There it is. Another translation says to give strong support to those. Here's another verse. To show himself strong on behalf of those. In other words, God is going to show off on your behalf. Think about that. What would that mean for every area of your life? We're going to talk about that specific life of being fully supported by God. But first I want to talk about some random verses. Some random verses. Now a lot of these I just love them. Many of them have become my life verse over the years. And uh, I've, I've printed them off. I put them on different places. They're on a screensaver on my laptop. Things like that. And Anna's even turned them into wall art. So we have them in our shop or my shop, my man cave, and, her, and, and around her house. And her. Did you notice that? I, did you notice what I just did? My man cave, her house. Did you notice that? That's how you do 38 years of marriage right there. There's a marriage lesson for you right there. And that was total slip, believe it or not. But I hope you guys are falling more and more in love with his word each week. You're falling more and more in love with God, more and more in love with your Bible, that you are realizing that God said that. And since God said it, it's important. And I can do my life with it. I can do my life on it. So that's what some of these random verses are all about. Now, I want you to have a little fun with me because if God said it, it's important. But if it's not in the Bible but you thought it was, may not be as important, all right? Okay, so let's find out what you think is in the Bible and what you don't think is in the Bible, okay? I'm going to give you a little test. Charity begins at home. In the Bible, raise your hand. Oh, not in, I wonder what the 11 o'clock, not in the Bible, raise your hand. Oh, how many of you just don't know? You've you got to commit one way or the other, all right? Charity begins at home. How many of you think that might be Scripture? All right, how many of you say, no, nah, that's not Scripture? Okay, here we go. No, it's not Scripture. No, <laughs> no it's not. Good idea. Good idea, not Scripture. How about this one? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is that in the Bible? How many think that's really not in the Bible? Would you raise your hand? Okay, yeah, that's Luke chapter 6, verse 31, word for word in the Bible. Cleanliness is next to godliness in the Bible. How many think that's not in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. Nope, that's not in there. Does the Bible say that a man ought to smell good? 
<laughs> we have a female down here going, yeah, my Bible does. My Bible says it. Does the Bible say, though, that a man ought to smell good? How many think the Bible would address something as trivial as that? Raise your hand. How many say, God didn't care about that? He didn't. It's not in the Bible. Would you raise your hand? The verse on the side screen, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7. So go ahead and eat your food and with joy and drink your wine with a happy heart, for God approves of this. Wear fine clothes with a what? Can you believe God would be interested in that? And we know, yeah, I know. And you know, we're, see, if that was written to a woman, we'd all go, oh, yeah. How do we know it's not written to a woman? Because it says, and love and enjoy your wife. Right after that, the verse says, and love. so it's talking to men. And trust me, you will enjoy her a whole lot more if you smell good. <laughs> this is hunting month, so I thought I would throw that one in. It, does the Bible refer to it as a negative thing to have weeds growing up in your lawn? You think God cares about weeds in your yard? I mean, seriously, would God care about that? I mean, how many of you think that the Bible does not say anything about you have weeds in your lawn? doesn't refer to it as a negative thing. Would you raise your hand? How many of you think the Bible, yes, addresses that as a negative thing? Would you raise your hand? Okay, here's the verse, Proverbs 24. I walked by the field of a what? I saw that it was overgrown with needles, and it was covered with what? Because stewardship, the taking care of what God has given you, is extremely important to God. So it is looked at as a negative thing if a person doesn't take care of the things that God gives them. Here's another one. Um, does the Bible talk about the fact that you, men should give women jewelry? All the women are like, yeah, you don't even know. You've never read that. You just guess. Good idea, Lord. How many of you think the Bible, God said men should give their wives jewelry? Would you raise your hand? How many of you think God wouldn't really care if you did or not? Would you raise your hand? Okay, cool. That's good. That's good. Here we go. Song of Solomon. How lovely are your cheeks, your earrings set them afire. How lovely is your neck, enhanced by a string of jewels. We will make for you earrings of gold and beads of silver. In other words, what he's saying is, woo, woman, you're so fine. We're going to buy you some jewelry. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. But to be really honest with you, man, that's not what he said at all. He said, we're going to what? Make you some jewelry. Right? So if your husband makes you a macaroni cheese necklace, <laughs> that counts. You know what I'm saying? Give me something right here little bit of credit for that. But isn't that something? Did you not know that? I mean, the, the Bible tells men they ought to smell good and tells men they ought to also give their wives or make their wives some jewelry. Now, does the Bible say that a loyal wife should be rewarded by her husband? Now, think about that. Really? Just because you, I married you. Isn't that reward enough? I mean, isn't that just go with the deal of being married to a man that you would be loyal to that man? I mean, how many of you think that God wants us to reward a wife just for being loyal to us? Would you raise your hand? Okay, how many thinks God really didn't say that? It's kind of part of it. Okay, let's take a look at that. Proverbs 31, her husband can trust her, and she will greatly enrich his life. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. That's what Jael was talking about. She's not freaking out, worried about a whole bunch of stuff. She just trusts in God. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. A whole lot said in the Bible about laziness. And then it says to do what? Everybody read that part. Reward her for all she has done. A woman that enriches your life is to be rewarded by you. Wow. Well, let me give you some other ones. These are just great life verses. Psalms 34, 19 on the side screen. A righteous person faces many trouble, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. Oh, thank you. And I just pause and say, thank you, God. Thank you for that. I love that verse. Don't like the first part of the verse, but oh, I love the last part of that verse. Psalms 9, verse 1. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell all of all your marvelous things that you have done, and I will be filled with joy because of you, and I will sing. I will sing praises to your name, the Most High. You know, every person that comes to church ought to open their mouth and sing. Can I tell you something about me? I cannot sing. Really, I can't. 
My wife doesn't want to hear me sing. My kids, my grandkids, are, pop, pop. Oh, turn the radio up. Good Lord. I cannot sing. I cannot, but my Lord wants me to sing. So you know what I do? I sing. I sing because that's what he wants. That's what I'm going to do. And then, then, then look at this one here. This is good. Proverbs 28, verse 25. Greed causes fighting. Now, read the last part of it. Just jump in here. Trusting the Lord leads to prosperity. Last part again. Everybody read it. Trusting the Lord leads to prosperity. I want you all to read this one. Proverbs first, uh, chapter 21. Everybody read it together. The wise have health and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. One more time. The wise have health and lu- wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Psalms 25. For the honor of the Lord, O Lord, uh, honor your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. <laughs> huh. I mean, I feel that way. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path that they should choose. They will live and say the word, and their children will do what? Ah, uh, there's going to be some stuff left over. Not only am I going to have it, but the kids are going to have it when I'm gone. Here's Proverbs 21. Some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. Some people are always greedy for more. Read the last part. But the godly love to give. You know, that's what I love about you guys. I love the fact that you are so generous. I mean, remember a service not long ago where we needed to raise some money for 4640? And in a live service on Sunday morning, I said, hey, we need to raise some money. And people were raising their hands going, I'll give this, I'll give that, I'll give 5000 I'll give ten, I'll give twenty. And people were just doing whatever they could do to give. And, and, and we see it week after week after week. And our children's ministry is what it is because you godly people love to give. Our youth ministry is what it is because you godly people love to give. You're sitting in a beautiful, the nicest, in my opinion, worship center on the Western Slope because godly people love to give. And thank you. Thank you for that because it's, it's so, so true. Let me see. Where's the next one? Where's the next one? Uh, Proverbs 21.5. Is that right? Proverbs 21.5. Let's throw that one up there. Look at this verse. I like this. When good planning and hard work leads to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. That's a good life verse. Because many of us are going to be tempted to do a shortcut. It's not going to happen. not going to work for you. Ecclesiastes 7.21 says, Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant curse you, for you know how often you yourself have cursed others. Did you all know that was in the Bible? Well, I just need to know what they're saying. No, you don't. No, you don't. You know, it used to be hard. The word eavesdrop, by the way, because a lot of people may not know what that means. The word eavesdrop means to listen in, to snoop, or to nose around. Now, this was much more difficult several years ago. In order to eavesdrop, no, you had to be in a privileged place, or you had to be on the other side of a wall of somebody who was talking about you, and they didn't know you were there. Am I right? So it wasn't really easy to get some information. Now, do you know the number one way that people eavesdrop today? Internet, right? I just got to go on Facebook, see what they said. I got to go on their Instagram, see what they commented about last night when we were at dinner, right? So all of a sudden, you're eavesdropping, and you get, you get all hurt, and, and, and uh, you can't believe they said that, and this, that, and the other. And God said, don't do it. Don't do it, because you know yourself that you've said some things about some other people that you would not want them to know you said, right? So don't be listening in with somebody else. So, so Because when you get all hurt because you saw something somebody said on Facebook, what are you, 12 years old? Amen. Just grow up, shut up, get off that stuff, because you know you've said it too. and you It's just stupid for people to put it out there in print. I've always said, listen, if I want to confront somebody, I'm never going to put it in an email or a letter. It's going to be nose-to-nose, face-to-face. That way, if I want to deny it later, I can do it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I didn't say that. Because <laughs> you, know? you can't deny it if you wrote it. I'm just, you know, I'm messing with you. Not really, but I am. <laughs> Proverbs 20, verse 12. Ears to hear and eyes to see. What are they? Read it. Both or what? Anybody agree with me that being able to hear and being able to see is a tremendous gift from our Heavenly Father? And the older you get, the more you realize, huh? Yeah. That's a gift. Proverbs 18.9 says, A lazy person is as bad as someone who destroys things. I don't like lazy people. Proverbs 19.3 says, People ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they get angry with the Lord. You know anybody like that? Have you ever counseled somebody? You counsel somebody and they go, I don't know why God let this happen. I don't know why God let that happen. And you want to tell them what the Bible says. You're too stupid to be human. 
That wasn't God. That was you. You pulled the trigger on that. You made that decision. You ran that one out. And then what do they do? Then they get mad at you. Because all you're doing is pointing out the fact that they don't have any reason to be mad at God. They did that. That was their call. That was their decision. It wasn't God. Proverbs 15, 25. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but he what? The property of widows. My mom's a widow. I worry about her sometimes. And then this verse tells me God got her. God's protecting her. I'll do, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. What do you want me to send her? But God's protecting her. Proverbs 15, 22 says, plans go wrong for a lack of advice. Many advisors brings, what's the word? Success. Success. Yeah, you got to get counsel. Got to get good advice from good people. Proverbs 15, 14 says, and these are all life verses. Lots of them I've printed off, and they've been taking me through a season in the past. A wise person is hungry for knowledge, while fools feed on what? You know, I, uh, I always ask myself the question when I, when, I, when I see this verse, because I read through the Proverbs every 30 days, and the question I ask is, what am I reading, what am I watching? What am I reading, what am I watching? Because if you're going to be a wise person, you're going to be hungry for knowledge. But if you're just watching stupid television programming, reality shows that are going nowhere with stupider people than you watching it, then, man, you are going nowhere. You're sitting, you're, what are you reading? What are you watching? Really super important life lesson. Proverbs 14, 23. Work brings profit, but mere talk leads to what? Now, what if you get in trouble at work? What if you do something stupid? What if you just make a mistake? The boss is mad at you. Should you quit? Let's well, see what the Bible says. If your boss is angry at you, what's it say? Don't quit. Don't quit. It says a quiet spirit can overcome even great mistakes. Now, imagine yourself having coffee with God one morning, and you're having difficulty at work. And he leads you to this verse where you're thinking about cashing it in, and he says, don't quit. Just be quiet. Just have a a very humble spirit. I'm going to work this thing out for you. See, how he'll, he'll guide you this way. Life, life first. Proverbs 17, 9 says, Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Mm-mm-mm. Proverbs 19, 22. The Bible says, Loyalty makes a person attractive. Everybody read that one with me. Loyalty makes a person attractive. Everybody read it again. Loyalty makes a person attractive. So if you're not very good looking, just be loyal and you'll get prettier. Every time. Every time. Well, those are some random verses. Let's see if they lead up to a specific life of being fully supported by God. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those, now this is, this is our part, whose hearts are fully committed to him. Now, we want to be a person that's strongly supported by God, who shows himself strong on our behalf. What do, what's our part in that? Whose hearts are fully committed to him. There's a law of reciprocity that is talked about over and over in the Bible by principle. It's a relationship between people involving the exchange of goods, services, favors, or obligation. To be reciprocal just basically means to give and take. So there's no way that you can be committed to anything. I can't be committed to you if there's not some give and take. You can't be committed to this church. Well, I come to this church because this church feeds me. Okay, that's good. What are you doing? What are you giving back? Well, I show up and fill up a seat. Well, good for you. Good for you. I bet that seat would be just fine if you weren't in it. Really would. I'm telling you the truth. It'll be all right. It'll be there the next week. Matter of fact, it might even last longer. But the truth that I'm trying to say is, Anything that you're a part of that's going to grow and be important to you has to be give and take. I can't have friendships with anybody if there's no give and take. If they're always feeding me and I'm never taking them out to feed them, that's not a friendship. If they're calling me, you know, hey, you want to go have some fun? I'm never calling them saying, you want to go have some fun? If all of a sudden the only time I ever call them is is when I need them and it's 10 o'clock at night and I call them and they're taking me out to coffee and we're sitting down at Denny's just having a cup of coffee and I'm pouring my heart out to them and they call me at 10 and I go, you know, click not answering it, that's not reciprocation. That's not a commitment to that particular thing. Now, since commitment is such an important fact when it comes to any great relationship being greater, you don't have a great relationship in marriage or anything else without there being a commitment on both parts. I have to take my commitments very seriously. And here's the truth. There's way too many options for me to be committed to. So I can't be committed to everything, right? I am not committed to soccer. 
I'm not. I don't go to the kids' soccer games. We, and I don't, we don't have any to play it. I don't do that. I, I, we, I'm not, not committed to peewee football. Now, some of you in your stage of life, you are committed to soccer. You are a soccer mom. You got the van and the little ball and the stick figures on the back of your window, and you are a soccer family. And it's one of your commitments, and you have to put it in there for this season of life. I, I'm not committed. You know, the only thing I'm really committed to is my grandkids' dance recitals. I support them. That's great. I pray I don't have to go, but oh, God, thank you for giving them. No, I go. But since there are so many things that are pulling for your time and your attention and your money and your full commitment, you've got to decide what I'm going to be committed to and what I'm not, right? So let me give you my top five. Number one or number five in this order. Number five, counting up, boom. I'm committed to my friends. I am committed to my friends. Listen, if you get me as a friend, you got help. If you get me as a friend, you got somebody that's going to make a difference. The Bible said, iron sharpeneth iron. And you're not going to be in a close personal friendship with me without getting better. I promise you that. I am committed to my friends. If my friends need me, I'm there. If my friends are acting a little crazy, I'm going to forgive them. If they do something stupid, we're going to deal with that fault and move on. But I am committed to my friends. Now, if they need to be confronted, I'm confronting them. Hey, you said that. It hurt my feelings. I don't know what you're thinking when you did that. I don't like that text you sent me. Did you mean that for me? Don't do that again. I will do that with my friends because I want my friendships with my friends to last. Now, I'm talking about my close friends because when it comes to my close friends, we want there to be fun. We want there to be laughter. We want there to be some give and take, and there's going to be hurt, and there's going to be tears, and there's going to be sitting in the hospital with a friend or a loved one. There's going to be all that kind of stuff, but they're going to be there for me too. But I am, I am committed to my friends. I want you to know that. I respect my friend's marriage. Listen, if, I'm, if me and Anna are a part of a couple's life, we're going to make their marriage better. We will. I, just by hanging out with them, we're going to make their marriage better. They're going to oversee some things and hear some things in Anna and I that, that they like and that they don't like. And they're just going to deal with it. But here's the truth when it comes to my friends. I, don't inv- I, I respect their marriage. Here's a, I will not have a conversation with one of my buddy's wives without him knowing it. No. Mm-mm. And if she needs, we got a good friend here in the, in the church. We got, went out to dinner the other night. But anytime she, the wife of my buddy, my hunting buddy, needs to get a hold of me, she needs to talk to me, she will always send it to me in a group text where Anna's phone's getting the same text I'm getting. Does that make sense? And believe me, I hate group text. Hate them. Hate to be involved in group text. But because you never get out of those things. Have you ever noticed that? They're still talking across the country at 2 o'clock in the morning and your phone's still going to go off on the, and a stupid group text. But anyway, if you know how to get out of a group text, please tell me how to get out of a group text. But anyway, so but here's what I know about that. I respect their marriage so much, I don't have conversations with their wife they don't know about. And they don't have conversation with my And we don't text one another. There's always group text going on if we want to communicate male to female in friend relationships. Why? Because we cherish and respect each other's marriages that much. There's not going to be any flirtation going on. We're not going to get together and, and try to be trying to be seeing what kind of flirtation thing we can have going. It's not going to happen. You know why? Because I'm committed. Committed to that friendship. To make it better. To make it better. I'm committed also. Look at this. This is good. Second one on the screen. Number four, I'm committed to my work. I'm committed to work. Now, my friends need to know this. If I'm working, I'm working. Let's go out and party on Friday night. I'm getting up early on Saturday morning. i got to be my best and I can't do it because I'm committed to work. I'm committed that when I go to that workplace, I'm trying to be the very best I can be. I'm going to do the very best I can do. That workplace is going to know that I'm there to make a difference. I am not another name on your payroll that you have to worry about. I'm not another insurance that you have to pay. If I step into the doors of this place, I'm going to make a difference in this place because I'm going to care about this place, and I'm representing my God in this place. So when you get me, you get the best of the best that Grand Junction has to offer in the employment line. Yes, you do. You get the best of the best. I'm going to put myself into it, and if you lose me, you lost something. And if you're doing layoffs, you're going to look at me three times, four times, five times and make up a fake position just to keep me around because you don't want to lose me to somebody else because you know you're going to need me again when this company gets going again. I'm committed to work, committed to it, absolutely 100% committed to work. I'm committed to my church. I'm committed to church. I'm giving you my top five commitments. And some of yours are going to be different for different seasons of life. But here's one that should never change. I'm committed to my church. In this place, 
children are accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. If they were killed in an automobile accident, God forbid, if they were to get a disease and die early, they're going to have a home forever in heaven, and mom and dad, you will have them forever because they prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into their heart and save them in kids' church or in, or, or in 4640. In this place, people are accepting Christ as their Savior. In this place, drug addicts are getting off drugs and getting their life together. In this place, marriages that were having a hard time are all of a sudden praying together and united together and sleeping closer together at night and tucking into each other. In this place, people who have gone through economic problems and having to deal with jobs have tucked into God, put God first, and all of a sudden found their life blessed financially more than they've ever been and now doing that life of wealth, luxury, and prosperity. In this place, in this place, lives are being changed. In this place, eternity is being set in, is set in motion. In this, place, in this place, people are getting help. Now, you tell me one other experience you have in your life where that's going on. Then let me tell you something else. This is the highest stakes game in town. And the hospitals, the attorneys, the doctor's offices, or any multi-million dollar corporation does not match up with Fellowship Church and what we're accomplishing in this community. This is the best of the best of what you can do. And we are fully committed to it. Fully committed. Now, like I said before, are you? Because this has to be a give and take. You see, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that doesn't mean just going to church. What are you doing? Are you singing? Are you ushering? Are you praying with anybody? Are you going to a hospital? Are you serving in the children's ministry? How about the youth ministry? Are you serving when somebody loses a loved one? Are you helping out with funerals, hospital visits? Are you praying with somebody down here that's hurting? No, I come. Not serving then. Not serving. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm committed to that. Commitment number two, climbing up to number one. I'm committed to my family. I'm committed to my family. First and foremost, I learned a long time ago the kids were leaving. And there would be two people left in that house that would have to look at each other, listen to each other, eat, talk, tell the same old stories, and do life with. And that's my wife and me. I tell her all the time, honey, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. <laughs> That's how committed I am. You'll see me in the back of the car. I'll just be sitting back here quiet, but I'll be with you. I'm committed to it. <laughs> committed to it. I'm not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. We're committed to this thing. To the good times, the bad times, the difficult. And when you feel in love and you feel out of love, just, just stay with it till you feel in love again. Because this is what I know about women. You can all be a big pain <laughs> in the neck. Every one of you can be high maintenance, demanding. You can come up with lists for men to do until Jesus comes back, and then you'll hand him a list. <laughs> so if we trade the one we got, we're going to get another one just like her. The problem with the new one is you hadn't figured her out yet. So she can fake you out for a little while, then you go, oh, there she is. <laughs> now, you women aren't laughing very good, and that's okay because you don't need to. But you men are just big cowards. I'll tell you that right now because you ought to be getting with me on this. Well, let me tell you what I know about men. We're all a big pain, a little bit lower than in the neck. And we can be moody, and we can be grouchy, and we can go through difficult times and difficult seasons, and we can be hard to live with, and we can take you right up to the crazy point. And then we go, oh, God, you're going to jump, and grab you and pull you back. And we know when we push you to that limit. We do. I'm sorry, guys. I'm telling the truth. We do. And this is what I know about us men. You trade them in, and you get another one. And you're going to get another one just like them. Fully committed to family. Fully committed to family. Starts with that husband and wife relationship. You see, I believe your marriage can be whatever you want to make it. I'm, I'm committed to Anna. I'm committed. She's been a loyal wife to me. So you know what my job is? I have to reward her. Reward her. That's my job. But I'm committed to it. I get a kick out of it. I love it. I love it. And my final commitment, I am fully committed to my God. 
I'm not one foot in on this one, one foot out. I don't go anywhere where I don't, I can't, I don't, I would be ashamed to tell them I am a child of God. I'm a born again believer in Christ. I am spirit filled. I love him with all of my heart. You think Tim Tebow was bold when he knelt down on a field? Yeah, he was bold. He was bold. And I don't know how much he had to pay for that boldness. I don't know where he's going yet. But let me tell you something. That's nothing to my boldness with Christ. Nothing. Whoop! You're a pastor. You've got to be that way. No, I'm a person. And I understand through God's word that he is to me my first love, my first conversation in the morning, my first consideration for every problem, the first person I turn to when I'm happy, when I'm sad, when I'm hurting, when I'm filled with joy, whatever it is. I love him, and I'm fully committed to him, fully committed. That's why when friends go, hey, you want to do this? And I go, eh, no, no. I have a problem telling you no. Hey, you want Hooper, you want to come on, man? We're going to no. Nah, I'm good. I'm good with that. Somebody wants to flirt, nah, committed to home, committed to home with all that. Don't need that. Don't need it. Well, how about your ego? Don't that feel you? Nope. No, my ego is just fine. Hasn't been for a long time because of my commitment with God. Good. Good. Let me show you something that uh, if you would learn this, if you'd really get this down, let it be a life. Verse 3, first of all, this commitment to God, fully committed to God, strongly supported by God. Fully committed to God, strongly supported by God. And then uh, I want to give you the close. I'm going to close right on time. Woo! Ah. I'm going to give you the best life lesson I've ever learned. But don't, not yet, not yet, not yet. Everybody stand with me if you would, please. I want, I want you to imagine something with me. I want you to imagine your marriage being strongly supported by your Heavenly Father. Now, you're the guy in the relationship. And whether we like it or not, women and men, God put the financial responsibility of providing for his family on the husband. Okay? That's what he did. That's what he did. And that weight's heavy. Heavy weight. Two kids, one of them had medical issues in the past. That can, be, that can be a lot, right? And not that she doesn't feel it, but she doesn't feel it like you feel it, I guarantee you. Guarantee you. And I guarantee you there's been nights where the weight's so strong that you're like, God, you didn't make me strong enough for this, right? But imagine for a second the Heavenly Father going, I'm about to show off for you. Who? For me? Yeah, for you. Mm -hmm. I'm about to blow your wife's mind by what I'm going to do with you and for you. Okay? I haven't been able to buy her jewelry. Hmm. Want to freak her out? Let God let you bless her because he really loves her. He really loves, she's like his little princess. So he wants her taken care of, but not just by anybody, but by you. The very first piece of jewelry I bought my wife, I hate telling this story. Anna, she's not, I don't think she's in here, this service. She just hates it, hates the story. But I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to tell you something. 38 years ago, I went down to Zales, right after we got married. And I bought her a little ring for, 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 the, for the wedding, you know. And it had a little tiny diamond you couldn't see in it. You know, it was like one thirty-second of a whatever. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. And this was 38 years ago. And I went down to Zales right after we got married. It was Valentine's Day. We got married in, I don't know, when, April, I don't know. But the next Valentine's Day, it was April. The next Valentine's Day, I bought her an Omega gold watch with diamonds all over the face of it. And um, I was making $800 a week. 38 years ago, 800 a week, okay? That's good money today. Think about that 38 years ago. New cars living in a country club apartment. So I'm making 800 a week. I go down to Zales. I fill out the form. I get the watch, and my payments were $18 a month. 18 a month, right? But I'm making $800 a week. And then a church calls me and says, we want you to come work full time for us. And I said, yes! And I had a franchise of my father's business, and I closed it down. I gave some of it to my family. And then um, I never asked the church what they would pay me. 
And when I got there, my first paycheck, because I never asked, $180 a week. $800 to $180. So I went back to my sweet wife, and I said, baby, it was the only payment we had. I said, I can't, I can't make that $18 a month payment. I, I need to take the watch back. And she said, here, that's fine. Don't stress. So I took the watch back down to Zales. Back in 38 years ago, you could do this and it didn't hurt your credit at all. I went, ma'am, I, I can't afford to pay this. She goes, that's fine. I'll take it. I'm so sorry it didn't work out. And that was it. And I felt like, oh, my God. I can't believe I gave my wife a watch and had to take it back because I couldn't afford $18 a month. Now, don't you feel sorry for her? Ladies, don't you feel sorry for her? Oh, God, don't feel sorry for her. Because I've paid her back. That one watch is probably, that one watch being taken away has probably got her more jewelry over the years <laughs> than any other thing she could have ever happened to her and I. But you know what I do? I talk to God a lot about her. I say, well, but God, you want me to reward her? Well, I'm going to need some money up in here. You want me to take her to a nice place? I'm going to need to be blessed myself. You want me to provide for this family? Then I'm looking to you and only you, not my boss or, the, or, or this economy. And all of that responsibility has just made me tuck in more with him. So here is, if you'll get this, 56 years on this planet, 56 years, the greatest, most important life lesson that I have ever learned and it has affected every area of my life. Take a look at it. If what's important to God is important to me, then what's important to me is important to God. If what's important to God is important to me, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness then what's important to me is important to God, and all these other things will be added to you as well. If what's important to God is important to me. God, you got my first 10%. You got my first time every morning with coffee with you. I talk to God before I talk to Anna. I'm up an hour and a half before she's up. and I'm talk she's God's the only one in my house I can talk to. You don't talk to a woman when she first wakes up. Do you know that? That's another life lesson. <laughs> he gets the first consideration of every day. He's the first one I call when I have a problem. And I talk to him about everything. You know why? Because I'm fully committed to a relationship that goes back and forth. I was talking, man, I meant to close on time. Look what happened. I was talking to a doctor friend of mine the other day, extremely intelligent and very wealthy and a good friend of mine. And he had something physically wrong with him. And I said, Doc, I'm going to pray for you. I said, I want you to know that. I'm going to pray for you. Ask God to heal you. He goes, I don't pray for myself. And I went, what? I pray for myself all the time. He said, I don't pray for myself. I thank him for my eyesight. I thank him for my skills. I rely on the doctors and the nurses and the therapists for that. And I go, you don't know of a Doctor or nurse or a therapist who could miss something, overlook something, not see something, or just treat you as a number? You don't know one like that? I said, do both. Thank him, but then ask him. I said, I'm going to give you something embarrassing. If I, I had a sprinkler head in my yard that was not working. So I got my tools. I went out in the yard. I started digging around the sprinkler head. And, and this is my talking to God while I'm doing it. God, help me to fix this sprinkler head. This is frustration. I don't want to spend any more time on this. I just need it to work. I don't want it to be a frustration. I don't want to have to go to Home Depot again. Please, not another trip to Home Depot. Home Depot has made me my own parking space down there. It is embarrassing. I don't want to go back. But I will. But I sure like some favor to push down the frustration. You talking to God about a sprinkler head hooper? Yep. Yep, because there's a guy in the Bible that wasted, or did he, a miracle from God to put an axe head back on an axe handle. If it's important to God, it's important to me. And then what's important to me becomes important to God. The law of reciprocation. Father, we love you so much. 
And since life pulls at us in so many different directions and wants us to be committed in this area and that, we all have to decide what our top five is. We all have to decide what we're going to give 80% of our time to, what we're going to give 20% to. We all have to decide that. But for me, it's you, then it's my family, then it's my church, then it's my work, then it's my friends. Everything else can just find time after that. But thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much for your love. Because what's important to you is extremely important to me. And thank you. Thank you that because of that. The things that are important to me, the really big things, being able to bless my wife, provide for my family, pay my bills, have health to be able to do it, to the very little things of fixing a sprinkler head. Thank you that all those things, well, they're important to the God of this universe. 